some of you were, are friends with me on Facebook, and some of you aren't. But for those of you who aren't, so yesterday, after it got done raining, I took the grandkids out of the house. Let's go to the campus. And so we go to the campus. We hang out for a couple hours because walking 1.5 miles with them takes two hours. Okay, and so we're all over the place having a good time. It's getting cold. I said, okay, let's go to Sheets and get some hot chocolate. Okay, yeah, and instantly Liam's like, can I get a snack? Dude, you ain't getting no sugar, okay, no candy, right? And so we go in, and I'm getting a couple of things here. I'm getting something for Tony. She wanted something. I'm getting this over here. And all of a sudden, Liam holds up this little pack, and it has two donuts in it, chocolate one and a vanilla one. I said, okay. I don't really look at it. I said, okay, no problem. So we go up, we pay for everything. Before I could even look at it again, he grabs it before she could bag it. We're out in the car. He's in the back seat. <laughs> he's like, sugar, okay? And he gives one to Carson, and I'm not really paying attention. And all of a sudden, I hear, ugh. And I see Liam. He got his head out the door going, <laughs> I said, what? He said, they're dog biscuits. <laughs> They both had tried to take a bite, and I am laughing, so I'm sitting in the sheets parking lot just dying laughing. Like, I can't breathe. Somebody help me. Call 911. <laughs> it was the best. How many know some things aren't what they seem? <laughs> hey, listen, before I get into the Word, I want to take this over here. Last, uh, let's see, on the 18th, no, 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 what is the date? The 9th. October 9th, Micah and Bethany, Pastor Micah, Pastor Bethany, had an anniversary. Amen. We always celebrate their anniversary because she has not killed him yet, okay? And, uh, but man, we are so blessed by both of them. We're so blessed that they're part of this body and serve this body. Amen. I'm not preaching that. I clicked the button and the song came up. Can we sing? I'm going to press a button. Can I press the button now? Can I press it? Huh? We've been doing a little series called Truth for Troubled Hearts. Uh, there's been a lot of troubled hearts in this era. There's things that cause our hearts to be troubled. And, and today I have this message that's called God is for you. You know, and I wanted to preach this out of Romans 8, but I'll show you that in a moment. But our core scripture has been Jesus saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Again, that word means don't let your heart be agitated. Um, don't, let it, um, don't let your heart cause inward commotion that steals calmness of mind and makes you restless. Anybody ever hear, have, have, lose, lose your calm? Anybody ever lose your, and become restless? Okay. Uh, don't let your heart strike you with fear and dread. Don't let your heart cause anxiousness, distress, perplexity. Anybody ever been perplexed? I've had things perplex me. I, I watch the news sometimes and I walk away perplexed, right? Um, and, and so on and on. Well, I wanted to preach some of the many verses of Romans chapter 8, but then I got stuck on this one. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Now, the Amplified Version says it like this. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be successful against us? How many know no weapon formed against you shall prosper? That is the truth of God's word, amen? And so I've been thinking about that. There are times in our lives when we are troubled by what's against us. Anybody ever have anything come against you that you've been troubled by? All right, I thought about this. Uh, as I, you know, there's a lot of things that we could say, but I want to mention four areas that I think come against us. They are spiritual forces of wickedness, Flesh and blood, self, and life circumstances. How, how many know our weapons, our, our, our battle is against principalities and authorities? How many know you do have spiritual forces of wickedness that do war against you, that seek to throw you down, to render you defeated? That's what Paul tells us, right? And so these forces of wickedness are working against you, working against your kids. But also, how many know sometimes we just have some flesh and blood working against us? Here's a news flash for you. Are you ready? Not everybody likes you. <laughs> and the moment that you can get to the point that you can accept that, you'll be okay. 
the fact of the matter is, a lot of those people don't like me. It's, I know it's hard to imagine. I've actually had people lie about me. Like a blatant lie. Like, okay, listen, if you're going to talk bad about me, use the truth because there's plenty of truth that's bad. Just don't lie. Pastor Troy put this nice post out. Let me tell you, Penny asked for a five-minute rebuttal. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, you are going to have some people in your life that you didn't do anything to, that for some reason don't like you, are against you, and they, some of them even want to see you fail. It's a terrible thing on their part, right? The fact of the matter is, sometimes you're against you, right? Because, man, sometimes we know every rotten thing about us. Right? We know all the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? We know what the, we, we, when we sin and when we this and we that, we're against us. And then there seems at times that there's just life circumstances. Things happen, right? Death happens and sickness happens and just, just things happen, okay? And as we live in this world, our hearts can be troubled by Satan, people, ourselves, and circumstances of life that come against us. But here's the truth. The truth for our troubled hearts is, that your heart is not troubled when an enemy is against you because God is for you. You see, I'm going to talk about each of these areas for just a moment. And when I talk about the enemy for a moment, I want to talk about Satan and his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness that is against you. I also want to talk about people, flesh and blood, because how many know whether it's a flesh and blood enemy or a spiritual enemy, how many know God is still for you, right? The fact of the matter is, there are times in your life where Satan comes against you in order to defeat you and to get you to walk away from God. Look at me. When Satan comes against you, it is most often an attack on your righteousness. The reason that he attacked Job was because of Job's standing, because of Job's righteousness. He said, let me at him and he will curse you to your face. Listen to me, not everything in our life is an attack because we're sinners or there's something wrong with us. How many know sometimes there's an attack because there's something good about you? Do you know some people are against you because they're jealous of you? Now, I know, I, I, that's hard to believe, right? Fact is, some people are jealous of your situation, your circumstances, your life, whatever's going on, that they're jealous. And that jealousy causes something to rise up within them, Okay? The fact is, there are times where the enemy comes against you because of your righteousness. You see, there are times in your life when Satan will release the hounds of hell against you, but God will release the armies of heaven against them. Make no mistake about it. There are times in your life where there is an enemy and he is warring against you. I can tell you about the hounds of hell. I can tell you what it is to go punch, counter punch with the enemy. I can tell you what it is to go back years ago whenever we were doing 11th Street and God was moving and God was doing so many incredible things and it was so cool and we'd have this great victory on a Sunday or a weekend and have this great trial on Monday or Tuesday. I can tell you what it is to go in this up and down, punch for punch battle with the enemy. There are times where he just releases the hell, the, the hounds of hell against you. One time I'll tell you a story. I was in the Sheets parking lot over on 13th Street. Don't like that Sheets. No, it's not there anymore. Praise God. I've had two bad situations there. Neither one were my problem. One was one day we had taken the dogs somewhere, vet or someplace. Well, anyhow, long story short, they break out in a fight in the back seat of the, the, the Suburban. So I got to jump in and I, gotta, I get bit in the process. Stupid dogs. So that, so that happened. That weekend or that week, then I go to Ohio where there's a conference. I'm a part of the pastor, Andre, who will be here in a couple weeks. He was there. All of a sudden, he has preaching, and he says, I got a word for you. And he begins to preach. He says, da, 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 and, the, and, the, and the Satan has released the dogs, of heaven against, or the dogs of hell against you, and you have been bitten by the dogs. I said, brother, you have no idea. <laughs> you, you got no idea. It's just, I, just, I said, you have no idea, brother. I really was bit by the dog this week. But there are times where he just releases. Do you understand? What he did to Job, he released hell on Job. He released hell on Job. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. There will come a moment in the midst of that where God will release the armies of heaven because he's for you. He will be your rear guard. He will be your buckler. He will be your shield. He will be the one that protects you. 
When flesh and blood come against you, I promise you Jesus will come against flesh and blood. Listen to me. When you're in a flesh and blood, blood, blah, 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 flesh and blood battle, don't you fight it. Keep your mouth quiet. You want to. How many of you, how many of you want to defend yourself? Right? How many, how many of you just say, you, hear, you heard the lie, and you heard how they maligned you, and they've come against you, and how many of you just want to rise to your defense? The problem is when we do that, God can't be our shield. The Bible says in Isaiah that our righteousness shall lead us and God will be our rear guard. It's not your job to watch your back. It's God's job. It's not your job to watch it. It's God's job. Year 2000, had a, had a man come to our church. He was a pastor. Pastor had uh, got basically thrown out of his church and he got thrown out of his church. He was now attending our church and, and for a while, I didn't know who he was and then got to know him and so forth and so on. And we brought him on staff and he was, you know, I'm, I've, been a, I've been a pastor here for maybe a year. And he was in ministry for 25 years. He was an orator. I'm a hack, all right? Couldn't preach my way out of a paper bag. Sometimes I still get there, all right? And I'm just saying, but I brought him on. And, and people, this is what people literally said to me. You better watch your back. He could steal you. He could steal your church. I said, yo, you mean I'm supposed to do the wrong thing because I'm afraid? He might do the wrong thing. No, God wants to play a plan of redemption. And if he stabs, it's not my job to wash my back. It's God's job to wash my back. And if he stabs me in the back, God will heal my back. Listen to me, folks. The fact of the matter is, you want to defend yourself. You want to do that. Don't do it. Allow God to do it. Allow God to be your rear guard. I mean, okay? Because I promise you, I promise you, he'll do a better job at it. Look at some of the Psalms. I was reading the Psalms, and I looked for two words. For me. For me. Check out some of these. Whenever you have the enemy coming against you, whether it's Satan or whether it's people, arise, Lord, in your anger. Raise yourself up against the rage of my enemies and stir yourself for me. You've ordered judgment. <laughs> you get the picture here? That God, how many, how many of you, mamas, I'm gonna talk to mamas. Mamas, how many of you mamas Stir yourself up when somebody messes with your kid. Uh huh. I've seen some of you in a stirred position. It's not pretty. The gangster mama comes out. You know what I mean? Like, she is going to cut your heart out with a spoon, pal. Right? The fact of the matter is, you get stirred up. Listen to me. This is the imagery that God, when he sees his people, you, his child, when he sees you, that, that, that the rage of the enemy has come against you, there is something that stirs him on your behalf. Look at this one. Then my enemies will turn back on the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. This I know that God is for me. And my enemies will be turned back. This one. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. For my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He accomplishes all things for me. He goes on. And he will send from heaven and save me. He will rebuke the one who tramples upon me. God will send his favor. And did you see what the psalmist knew? The psalmist knew that when everything comes against me, when my enemy comes at me, when my adversary wants to destroy me, this is what I know. God is for me. And this is what I know. He will rebuke the one who tramples me. This is what I know that God will accomplish for me that which he has planned. This one. Oh, not that. There's not another one. Ha. You see, your heart is not troubled when you, let's talk about you for a moment. We were just talking about people and I'm talking about Satan and talking about an adversary that comes against you. But what about when it's you? Have you ever come against yourself? Have you ever been your own worst enemy? Anybody? Okay, I just wonder because some of you just give me that. Nope, Pastor, I am the best thing since the last bread. <laughs> it's all of these people, not me. Think about it. How many of you have something about you that you don't like? And I'm not talking about your figure. <laughs> I just, we'll, just, we'll just call that a given. But how many of you have some character issues? 
that you just don't like about you? Anybody? Yeah. There's that thing that just, I wish, I, I, I hate this thing. You see, the fact of the matter is when you come against you for that which you hate about you. You know, there are things about me that I don't like. I know it's hard to believe. You know, there are things, but you know what I have come to figure out? Most of the things that I don't like about me and hate about me are things that when they are used in an unredeemed fashion, cause pain. When they're used in an unredeemed fashion, then they are negative. But the fact of the matter is when they are used in a redeemed fashion, how many know they can be used for righteousness? For example, I know this is hard to believe. I can get angry. I'm watching Pastor Micah, my son-in-law, and my daughter having a laugh at my expense. Everybody say, shame on you. Yeah. All right? Now, the fact of the matter is, that anger is a two-edged sword. When it swings the wrong way, it is used negatively by the enemy. It is used negatively by me. But when it swings the right way in a righteous anger, it is a really great tool. Because there are things that anger me that I will raise up and we will do something about it because God has put an anger in me about that. You see, if the problem isn't the anger. The problem is how I use it and how I let God use it. In a redemptive fashion, it is really good. In a non-redemptive fashion, it is really bad. Really bad. But I'll tell you what, it sure helps you repent. <laughs> right? How about when you come against you for the sins you've committed? Now, I know we're Christians, and none of you in here sin. But we're talking about those other Christians. Those other ones that go to that other church. We're talking about your in-laws. <laughs> right? The fact of the matter is, we find ourselves at times in sin. We find ourselves with a response that's sinful. Actions that are sinful. Attitudes. Anybody have a sinful attitude? Right? I may have spoke sinfully, right? Or how about when you come against you for your failures? Anybody ever failed? Both, you know, there's, there's all kinds of failures. I mean, there's failures in attempting to do something. Let me tell you something. You'll never accomplish anything if you're afraid to fail. But also, there's failures in our life, right? Times where we just fail God. We fail people. We fail our spouses. We fail our children. How many have ever failed your children? Right? That, that you have failed. And man, man, sometimes when you fall, how I many you know when you, you have a failure, you're just kind of like, ah, I'm lower than dirt. I'm the worst of the worst. Right? Peter, think about Peter. I don't know him. I don't know him. I haven't been with him. That's a pretty big failure. Weeps bitterly. He says, I'm done. I'm going fishing. I'm done. I'm going back fishing. But I think about Peter, when Peter's failure of his Lord, it was against him. But man, I'm so grateful a risen Savior stood for him. That he goes and he finds him at the sea, uh, by the sea, and he, and he says, man, you guys caught any fish? And he gives them that miraculous catch, and they come ashore, and Peter runs in there, and he gets there first. And Jesus has prepared a meal for his friend. He prepared a meal for his friend who failed him. He knew where Peter was. He knew his heart. He knew his failure. But I'm going to tell you what's great about God. He is not willing to leave us wallow in our failure. I'm not done with you, Peter. Peter may have been done with Peter, but God wasn't done with Peter. David, sin with Bathsheba. Isn't an amazing story? This man, bear couldn't take him out. The lion couldn't take him out. Goliath couldn't take him out. Saul couldn't take him out. The Philistines couldn't take him out. There was no enemy could take him out. The only one that could take him down was David. Right? And he has that terrible moment with Bathsheba. Lust over her. Sleeps with her. Kills her husband. And the Bible says there's a man after God's own heart. He says, in, he says in Psalm 51 that my sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. David said his sin with Bathsheba stood always before him, but how many know he always knew God was standing for him? 
The fact of the matter is, some of these verses I just read to you were penned by David. David understood, and David understood that what he did was wrong. And he came to a place of repentance. He came to a place of contrition. He came to that place where he understood. Let me say something to you, folks. The problem, the problem in our church today, the churches today, isn't sin. The problem is a failure to repent over sin. The problem isn't sin, gang. Sometimes we're going to sin. But I'm going to tell you something. A humble and contrite spirit, that's what he embraces. The fact of the matter is we've got to, we, 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 we right now have this attitude, and there's much of this attitude that don't you dare talk about my sin. Don't you dare talk about what I've done wrong. If you do, you don't love me. If you do, then you're judging me. If you don't, stop it. Stop it. The prodigal, he came and he stood before the father with self-imposed charges that would render himself a slave. But the father stood before the prodigal with the blessings of sonship. Come on. The good, good father that we sung about. The prodigal shamed him. The prodigal embarrassed him. The prodigal, in essence, was saying, I wish you was dead. Give me my inheritance. And then he went off and he spent it on women. He spent it on a party and he spent it on everything. Became a slave in a pig pen. He said, I'll just go back. When I go back, I'll just tell dad I want to be a slave. I'll just tell him I want to be one of his servants. I'll just tell him I want to be like one of the hired hands. You know what's really important about that? I've often said this. I use this as an illustration a lot. The spirit of the return was more important than the return. He could have returned in the wrong spirit. He could have returned with, well, yeah, I spent it all, Dad, but you don't understand. I this, I that, da, 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 And Dad, I want more. No, no, he came back broken. He came back humbled. He came back contrite. He came back in such a manner that the Father says, that I can embrace. That I can embrace. And he put the blessings of sonship. Here's my robe. Here's my ring. Here's my shoes. Do you understand this morning that God is for you? That he's for you even in your failure? Our hearts should be troubled over our sin. If our hearts aren't troubled over our sin, there's something wrong with us. But the truth that God is for us should bring peace to our hearts. Hmm? If you're not troubled over your sin, let me ask you why you're not. Why not? May our heart stay soft and pliable. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says it's the love of God that draws me to repentance. I'm not repenting over my fear. I'm repenting because he loves me. Changing my heart. Let's talk about life. Your heart is not troubled when life is against you. Because God is for you. Sometimes it seems like life is again. How many of you ever had a bad stretch of time? Hmm? Anybody ever had a bad stretch? I remember 2013. I'm laying in bed. And late at night thinking, I'm going to be 50 this year. <laughs> was not quite the response I had, but... And I'm laying there going, man, I, and I just had this like, hey, Lord, is my life half over? Are, are the, is the best behind me or is the best yet to come? And I'm just pondering things. 2013 was hell. It, it just was. It was just like we lost our son in May. I had rotator cuff surgery two weeks later. In July, I ripped the quad tendon off the kneecap. Ten weeks in an immobilizer or a year of that nonsense. Oh, my gosh. And so other things happened. It was just this. Thing. It was like, this is a bad stretch. This is a bad stretch. And sometimes what happens when we go through that stretch, that we have this idea that, man, God, are you for me? Or are you against me? God, where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? Why have you forgotten me? David wrestled with those thoughts. But listen to me. What we cannot allow and what cannot happen is that our current circumstance is not an indicator of God being for you or against you. Sometimes, gang, life happens. I'm a pastor for a long time. And I hear what people say to me. But let me say this. Your loved one didn't die because God's against you. I've had people say, what did I do wrong? Nothing. Why did God? Nothing. 
Your child didn't do what they did because God is against you. Sometimes children do dumb things. Except for my mother. She wouldn't know anything about that. Well, yeah, that's not true. My daughter, my sisters, they kind of did some dumb things. Listen, she has sworn a vow of silence when it comes to me. <laughs> the fact is, some of you got children, they're going wayward, and they've kind of lost their minds, and they've kind of lost their way, and it's, it's driving. You're saying, what did I do wrong? Listen to me. You probably did some things wrong. We all do as parents. I've done things wrong as parents. I wish I'd have got it perfect. I get a, I mean, you know, we get one try at this thing for the most part. It's not what you did wrong. God's not against you. God's not against you. You didn't lose your job because God is against you. Your spouse didn't leave you because God is against you. You see, what happens is these circumstances and these conditions, they have a way of making us create a narrative. God, you can't be for me. God, are you against me? Or at least questioning him. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do through those. Even he's not the author of those, and yet he will use them. The Bible says that God works all things for the good of those who love him. How many know he will work all things for the good of those who love him? But how many know even though he works good, for, of, he works good out of all things, how many know he doesn't create all things? You see, when conditions dictate the narrative that God is for us or against us, we are being governed by the waves of changing circumstances rather than the unchanging love of God. The unchanging love of God must be that which governs our heart, that which governs our thoughts, that which governs my mind, that this is what I know. What did the psalmist say? This I know God is for me. This I know God loves me. The narrative must be, come hell or high water, God is for me. Because there's such confidence in that. When the unchanging love of God governs our hearts, we are confident in spite of our situations, in spite of our circumstances. How many know we need to have a life sometimes that just says in spite of? You know, Pastor Troy was so gracious to me yesterday and said to me nice things. and Maybe one or two were true, but you know. But you know, I, I always know this. Whatever God has allowed me to be a part of, he has done in spite of me, not because of me. I understand there's times he uses our giftings, he uses, and we have to be vessels. But listen to me, just sometimes it's in spite of me, not because of me. <laughs> okay, amen? Oh, sorry, now amen. God's love never changes. Do you know he doesn't love you more saved than he did unsaved? He doesn't love you more, he doesn't love you more saved than unsaved. How many love your children more when they're doing well or when they're doing wrong? You might think you do, but you don't. You see, there's things that God does. Because God is for you, this is what he'll do. He will defend you. He will defend you. He will defend you against the accusations of the enemy. I love the story that you find in Zechariah chapter 3, when Joshua the high priest is standing before the Lord, and Satan is standing beside him to accuse him. And he's accusing him. And the Lord looks at him and says, shut up. The Lord rebuke you. Be quiet. This is mine. I plucked him out of the fire. Shut your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't you love them? Okay, and I know some of you don't like your children hearing that shut up word, so put your hands over your ears for a moment or something. But I love it sometimes when God tells the devil to shut up. When God says, I rebuke you. That's my child. I will defend him. Because God is for you, he will protect you. He will protect you. Looking good today? Tie on? Let's pray. She asked me to pray about something, and I said, we'll figure out when. Now's the moment. Father, right now, you see this situation, you see the circumstance, you see everything that happened. You see the heart of Martha. And Father, we pray for a number of things. We pray for freedom for the captive. 
Father, we pray for a setting free of, of the demons that are tormenting an individual, that are coming against that individual, that are uh, shaping words, shaping thoughts, shaping actions. And Father, we pray right now a release of this individual from the hounds of hell. But Father, we also pray a hedge of protection around Martha, Paul, Christy, Connor, their family, that God, you are the one that uh, is a shield. You are the one that is a protector. You are the one, God, that will absolutely keep them from any weapon prospering against them. And Father, today, you are for them and you will protect them in Jesus' name. Keep that situation in prayer, would you? You see, this is what God's for me. And when you're for your children, you protect your children. You don't let anybody mess with them. You protect them. You protect them from the enemy. You protect them from others. And you even protect them from themselves. Come on. And that's what God does. Because he's for us. He's going to bless us. I love the blessings of God. I love the blessings of God. Because he's for you. He will rebuke you. Uh, I like all that other stuff. I like that stuff of bless me, protect me, defend me, rebuke me. How many of we know we really don't like being rebuked? Hmm? Have you ever rebuked your kids and they've just, oh, thank you, mom, so much. Thank you, dad, so much. Oh, I'm so glad. In fact, Tony, you've never thanked me. <laughs> she was the easy one. God will rebuke you. David sins with Bathsheba. Sends a man named Nathan. You're the man. You're the man. You're the man. Because God is for you, he will convict you. Notice it doesn't say condemn. Aren't you glad he don't condemn us? But he will convict us. And if we lose our ability to be convicted of sin, God help us. Because God, his Holy Spirit, will convict us of sin. Come on, Troy. Everybody cheer. I was kidding. Even right now, some of us in this room, Holy Spirit's convicting. God doesn't convict to condemn. God convicts to correct. The fact of the matter is I did a podcast the other day, which I'm sure millions of people listen to, which most of you probably didn't listen to. But I was talking about I took Liam out golfing one day, as Eric and I. And Liam has got such a natural athletic ability. He has this great little baseball swing, and he's got this great little golf swing, and he swings the club really well. And we're out there, and he swings. And I looked at him and said, that's a bad swing. That's a bad swing. And he got mad at me. He got in the car. Pat, rah, rah. I said, what's the matter with you? You told me it's a bad swing. Well, it's because it was a bad swing. I love you enough to tell you it's a bad swing. I don't do you any good by telling you it's a good swing when it's not a good swing. I can only help you by telling you it was a bad swing. And me telling you it's a bad swing is not me not affirming you as a person. It has no bearing on who you are. Your golf swing was bad. You see, I mean, oh, true love always speaks truth in love. So he got up and he hit the next one and he ripped it. I said, now that's a good swing. That's a good swing. You see, what we don't like is when God says to us, that was a bad swing. What we don't like is when people around us have the audacity and the courage and the love to say, that was a bad swing. You probably shouldn't have posted that picture on Facebook. You probably shouldn't have had that attitude. I love you. And this comes out of relationship, amen? But no, no, what we got today is we got Somebody had the audacity to convict me. Somebody had the audacity to say something to me. Therefore, they hate me. Therefore, they judge me. No, I just love you enough to say you made a bad swing. Make a good one. He'll convict us. Because he's for me, he'll forgive me. Where would we, where would we be without the forgiveness of God? Where would we be without his forgiveness? Right? He's for me, man. But we cannot sin because he forgives us. Amen? Oh, God will forgive me. But if you go back to the whole context of Romans 8, this last part of Romans 8, God is for us. He's for you because he loves you. All of these things come out of one fact. God loves you. 
God loves you. It is unchanging. It is unconditional. It is unwavering. He loves you. Great words we're so familiar with. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. But in all these things, when the enemy comes at you and against you, you're a conqueror. When, you come at, when people come at you, you're a conqueror. When you come against you, you're a conqueror. When life seems to come against you, you're a conqueror. Not through you, but through him who loves you. For I am convinced, this is Paul, that death, not life, angels, principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How many know Paul summed it all up? He's got powers. He's got heights. He's got depths. Everything. You are more than a conqueror because God loves you and God is for you. The truth for troubled hearts is God is for you. That's the truth. Now I know what some of you are, some of you are just sitting there and saying, but pastor, you're giving me the, but pastor, why? But pastor, why? But pastor, why? If your pastor could answer, but pastor, why? He would have written 16 books and made millions of dollars. <laughs> and sold you some holy water out of our fountain. <laughs> I'm just having fun. Please don't, please don't send me texts and letters and notes. But let me have some fun at my expense. But listen to me. I was thinking the other day, I was talking to somebody. What we always want to know is why. Think about it. We're always asking the why question. How many know there are some things in this life and the whys we're not going to know? Why? Why did my son have to die? I don't know why. I don't know why. Why did the spouse leave? I don't know why. Like, I can't give you the, all the whys. I can give you the who. I can give you the who. And I can give you the what. And I can tell you this unequivocally. I can tell you this, just like Paul, that I'm convinced of one thing. God loves us. God is for you. That much I can tell you without a doubt. And I will tell you that he will see you through anything. And he can bring peace to your troubled heart because he's for you. So let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. What are you going to do if all the money goes away? What are you going to do if that person dies? What are you going to do? You're going to be an overwhelming conqueror in Christ Jesus. That's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to do when something doesn't work out the way you dreamed it would work out. When the thing ended not the way you thought it would end. I had great dreams of how things would end with my son. And that was not one of them. But I can tell you this much. We're still conquerors through Christ Jesus. You are still conquerors through Christ Jesus. The enemy won't steal your joy because God is the source of your joy. Oh, you'll mourn. You might, you might have lost some finances. You might be looking at challenges. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know God's for you. Here's the great confidence of the day that you walk out of here solidified in your heart. No matter what, God is for me. No matter what, God loves me. No matter what, I'm a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Come on, church. Oh, how he loves me. That's why I asked Pastor Troy, if you saw them up here huddling around, I threw him another curveball. I said, Troy, I want to sing that song. This, this is how I do it. This is so good. Hey, Troy. I want to sing that sloppy wet kiss song. <laughs> I don't know the names of the dumb songs. They just, don't, they just don't make what's the name of that song? How he loves. Okay, that makes sense.
Have you seen some of the titles? They just make no sense whatsoever. I said, Troy, I want you to sing this before I preach. Because I just wanted to kind of set the table. Because it is the love of God and the fact that He is for us that does bring rest to troubled hearts. So, Father, we come this morning. And we, first of all, we just say, man, God, thanks. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for being there for us. Thanks for being for us. Thanks for being for us, even when I'm against me. Thanks for being for us when life seems to be against us. Let our confidence in this era come from you and your unchanging, unwavering, unconditional love that will convict, that will point at us and say you But even in that, it is your love that draws us towards you rather than running from you.